moments of intense fear can precipitate this recognition, just as moments of intense grief or suffering can also do so. But these are, in a way, artificial means of initiating this waking up. There is a much gentler way much more natural way which is available to everyone at all times and under all circumstances which is simply to ask ourselves the question what is it that is aware of my experience how do I know that the knowing with which I know my experience is located in the body I don't the body is an appearance in my mind. The mind is not an appearance in the body. We have just been persuaded by our culture to believe that the mind appears in the body when it is everybody's obvious experience that the body appears in the mind. You are much bigger than your body. You are much bigger than your finite mind. All that is necessary is to keep going back again and again and again to the reality of your experience. What is it that is aware of my experience? I am that. Until in time this deep experiential conviction, not an intellectual conviction, although it may begin as such, but in time this deep experiential conviction begins to take root in us. I am consciousness. We feel it as strongly as we used to feel, I am the body. And as we become accustomed to taking our stand as consciousness, to making our home in and as consciousness, it begins to become clear gradually in most cases that this consciousness is without limits the limits are only for the finite mind the consciousness out of which the finite mind is made has no limits it is ever present it doesn't appear or disappear it wasn't born, it's not going to die. When I use the word consciousness, it, there is a slight tendency to reify what we essentially are, that is to make it a thing or a noun. So that's why I sometimes use the expression instead, the experience of being aware. That is what we essentially are, just being aware. Sat, chit, for those of you that were brought up in the Sanskrit tradition. And this simple, intimate, non-objective experience of being aware is not mixed with anything other than itself. There is nothing in itself which can limit itself, harm itself, agitate itself. Thus its nature is peace, imperturbable peace. That is why in the Indian tradition our essential nature is said not to be just sat 
and chit, being and awareness, but sat, chit, ananda, being, awareness and peace. This is not an extraordinary experience that I'm speaking of that I have access to, <coughs> that I have access to that, that you don't. It's just the self in each of us the very knowing with which each of the very ordinary knowing with which each of us is now knowing their experience whatever that experience might be some of us may be having a very pleasant peaceful experience others will be feeling resistant bored it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what the experience is it is being known that which knows it is infinite consciousness. All that is required is to become interested in the nature of the knowing with which we know our experience. Rather than being fascinated by the objects that we know. Leave your thoughts feelings, sensations and perceptions alone. Consciousness will take care of them in time. They do not need to be purified. They do not need to be changed. They do not need to be stilled. Consciousness is shining brightly in all experience. All there is to the sound of the aeroplane is hearing. And all there is to hearing is the knowing of it. All there is to our most uncomfortable feelings is feeling. And all there is to feeling is the knowing of it. Wherever you are in experience, you can just take these two simple steps. All I know of thought is thinking and all I know of thinking is the knowing of it. All I know of my feelings is feeling. All I know of feeling is knowing. All I know of the sight of the world is seeing. All I know of seeing is the knowing of it. With these two simple steps we can go directly from any experience, however positive or negative, directly to the reality of ourselves. And then we just rest there. And in time consciousness self-liberates itself from all the limitations that thought and feeling have superimposed upon it. That is the essence of the direct path. The, the withdrawing of the attention from the object and the, the return of the attention to its source as pure awareness, being aware of being aware, it is not something we should, it is not the goal, it's not the ideal state to be spending one's life in. It is just, it's a necessary stage for us to establish the reality of what we are. The idea is not then to leave one's attention always merged in its source and never going out towards experience, activities, relationship. That would be life denying. It would be only half the story. So the only... We should just come back. We, we come back, first of all, we withdraw the attention from objects bring the attention back to its source. First of all, to discover our true nature of 
ever-present, unlimited awareness. And subsequently, we, we bring the attention back again and again, just to rest the mind in its source, when it's not required for uh, activities, relationships, celebratory purposes, practical purposes, whatever. But we should feel, ha- having discovered the, the, the source of attention, the, the, the nature of ourselves, and having seen that whenever the attention goes out, in fact, it never leaves consciousness. The attention is always in the field of consciousness. So there's no question of, it's not really leaving, we don't really leave home anymore. We, we, we start working from home. We, we stay at home <laughs> rather than going out to the office. We, and, and then when we realize that wherever attention wanders in the realm of experience, it actually never leaves its home of awareness. Then the attention is free. Why keep the attention at, at home as opposed to going abroad? Because we know that wherever the attention goes, it's swimming in its source. Then there's the freedom to, to, to let the mind go out to, for whatever purpose, for relationship, for activity, for work, for practical purposes. And it's no longer a problem. It's no longer either or. Should I give my attention to the object or am I forgetting the source? It, it's the, 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 There's no conflict between the two. W- w- whether, so whether the, at one end of the extreme attention is resting in its source, the other end of the extreme, as you say, it's focused very specifically on an object. But much of the time, it's somewhere in between, not specifically focused on an object. The attention is fairly broad, but nor is it resting completely in its source. But wherever it is in the spectrum of attention, it's, it's, it's always at home. Because when we know the object, when we give our attention to the object, all we know is is the knowledge of the object. All consciousness knows is knowledge of the object. In fact, it's not knowledge of the object. All it knows is knowledge. What is knowledge? It is consciousness. Wherever it goes, it only knows itself. So and as long as we, once we have this feeling understanding, then there is this relaxation from feeling that we should be doing this or that with the mind. We just let the mind, if, if the mind is required by the world or uh, by circumstances, we just let the mind go there. If the mind is not required but by, by circumstances or the world, and no other creative or practical problem arises, then it, it, it's our pleasure just to let the mind sink back into its source. It's like, okay, I'm going to go and sit on my deck chair in the sun for half an hour, and then, okay, off I go again, out into activities, relationships, objects. That's all good. <clears throat> So where's the uh, left turn? I think, is it just a thought comes in and says, I'm, I did this? When in, in the process we, you just described, I mean... The, 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 the I did this thought is just an old habit that, yeah. that, that there is a, a self, some, a separate self yeah. somewhere in the system orchestrating the whole show. It's just not there. Yeah. The show carries on, the discovery that the that that self is not there it doesn't bring an end to the show it doesn't bring an end to relationships it doesn't bring an end to enjoying life it doesn't bring an end to creativity it 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 just brings an end to 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 the to the apparent orchestrator it, but it doesn't actually bring an end to it it just it was never there we just acted as if it was there and as if we were that 
Right. Um, but it's just a thought, and it's just thinking, and thinking, it's just knowledge of thinking, and it's just knowledge. So, I mean, even the thought, I did it, can be seen in the light of, yes, of it just it, being a word. that's true, as long as the thought, I did it, is just an old habit, right. as opposed to a thought in which we are really invested. If we really believe, I did it, then there is some investigation to be done. It's not enough to say, oh, it's just the I did it thought appearing. We would be slipping towards Neo Advaita then. So if, if, if it's for each of us to know, is, is the occasional appearance of the I did it thought just an old habit, in which case no problem, it's just, it, it just floats by. But if there is a real sense, I did that, then we should, we should take note of that and pause. And it means that there's some more investigation to be done about what the I really is. And then we go back. In that case, that is the time for pausing and allowing the attention to go back to its source to find what is the I at the heart of experience. Beautiful, thank you. The best way to be established in our true nature is to give our true nature our attention, to abide as that, in that, as that, and to see progressively in most cases that nothing can actually pull us out of that unless we give it permission to do so, in which case it will seem to do so. The, the movie cannot veil the screen unless we give it permission to do so, in which case it will seem to veil the screen. So if you find yourself losing yourself in experience, you are at that moment believing and more importantly feeling, I am a separate self. The thing to do would be to investigate that separate self. As your previous teacher rightly said, the separate self is an illusion. However, all illusions have a reality to them. There's no such thing as an illusion without a reality. The mirage in the desert is an illusion as water, but it is real as light. The email on the screen is an illusion as words, but real as screen. So it's true, the separate self is an illusion. But that illusion has a reality to it. And that is why the, separate, the, 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 the teaching says that if we give the, se the separate self our attention, if we turn our attention towards the self that we consider to be temporary and finite, we won't actually find a temporary finite self there. We find the eternal infinite self of pure awareness. If we give the snake our attention, we discover it is a rope. Then we realize that we were never actually giving the snake our attention because there was never a snake there to be attended to. But as long as it seems to be a snake, give it your attention. Discover it is a rope. So it's just as simple as going back to what you know over yes. and over. Yes, you feel that you are pulled out into the world, which usually means I'm overcome by my feelings. That's, that's basically what we mean when we say we've, we've been pulled out into the world. We've been overcome by our feelings. Which means we have temporarily forgotten what we essentially are, this inherently fulfilled, peaceful presence of awareness. So in that moment when we feel overwhelmed by our feelings, we can, there, there, are, there are many doorways. We, we, we could ask the question, okay, 
who is this I that is feeling overwhelmed? Or, as we've said many times this week, we could just ask yourself the question, what is it that is aware of my experience, or am I aware? These are all versions of the same question. They all direct attention to what we call I or myself. We, they direct attention to its reality. And as our attention begins to search for this upset self or hurt self or overwhelmed self, to begin with, it goes inwards into the body and mind, expecting to find this fragile hurt entity somewhere in here or somewhere in here. But the, the separate self is like a... Uh, imagine a, a sheet of paper sheet of A4 paper with a little hole, quarter inch hole punched in the middle of it. It seems that the space of the hole is in the middle of the piece of paper, just like it seems that the self is in the depths of the body-mind. But as you go towards the hole in the paper, you discover when you get right close up to it that the hole in the paper is empty space. And in fact, the paper is in the empty space. The space is not in the paper, although it seems to be defined and limited by it. It's exactly the same. If we go towards the separate self, the hurt self, the overwhelmed self, that seems to live in here, behind the eyes, or in here, in, in the chest, to begin with, we seem to go inwards into the body, or into the mind. But as we go closer to that I, we realize all there is to this I is being aware, or awareness itself. And this awareness itself is not a little hole in the middle of the mind or the body. It is a vast empty space in which the mind and the body appear. So although this investigation may take us inwards into the mind and the body to begin with, it very soon opens soon opens out and, and the, the self which seemed to be contained in the body and defined and limited by it is felt and understood to be this open empty space in which the body appears. Then having discovered that see what happens to your feelings of being hurt or overwhelmed. They cannot stand without the support of the separate self. So don't inquire into the emotions themselves, no. but who is this one who... No, don't touch the emotions themselves. Explore the one around whom the emotions revolve. Don't get busy with emotions, don't touch them. Now when you discover the, the non-existence of the self, around of the separate self around whom the emotions revolve. That will take care of, of, the, of the protagonist, of the main character in the story. And the story can no longer stand without the main character. However, there will be a residue of feelings in the body. It's like an echo of the feeling of overwhelm or hurt will remain in the body long after the storyline has been seen through. And it is that echo in the body that gets laid down as the deeper sense of me in the body and that builds up a felt sense of me in the body as opposed to a believed sense of me in the mind. And that felt sense of me in the body is, is the deeper root of the separate self and it's very tenacious. It survives the recognition of our true nature. And that is what our meditations in the morning uh, uh, for instance, this morning's meditation was a, a way of gently coaxing this me feeling that has uh, impregnated in the body, co coaxing it out of its hiding places and gradually dissolving it. But even then we weren't manipulating the feeling, we were just offering it or surrendering it to this loving empty space. We were allowing the loving empty space to take care of the feeling. We weren't tampering with the feeling itself. We weren't manipulating our experience.
if I were to ask you the question now, are you aware? What would you say? Yes. Okay. So you have now just made the effortless effort that you were referring to earlier. How much effort was required for you to be aware that you are aware? Very little or none. Well, was it very little or none whatsoever? Let's try it again now. If I ask you the question, are you aware? What's the answer? Yes. How difficult was that? None of How that. much effort did you make? That, that's it. Yeah, okay. That, that is, what you have just done is the highest form of meditation there is. No, I mean it seriously. What you've just done is what the Zen practitioners sit on their cushions for 10 years trying to do. I'm, I'm being serious. I'm not being clever. I'm being absolutely straight with you. In the moment that you hear the question, am I aware? That which is aware in you, awareness, turns its attention towards itself. And it says, oh yes, I am aware of the experience of being aware. It took you about half a second. That is the highest form of meditation there is. People practice trying to approach it for years and years and years and still feel that it somehow eludes them. But you, you went there in a second without making any effort whatsoever. Meditation is simply to remain there. And if you ever find yourself going away from that, you just ask yourself the question, am I aware? And your attention goes back to being aware. That's it. Meditation is just to remain being aware of the experience of being aware. It's not something that I am any better at than you. I, I don't have special access to it. Ramana Maharshi didn't have special access to it. He was no more qualified than you are to be aware of the experience of being aware. I, again, I, I'm, not being, I'm not being clever or facile with you. I'm, I'm being really straight with you. I take my pen from its sheath and offer its sharp linear blackness, unknowing to this open expanse of empty white, and give the world time to find itself, inviting it to unravel the lineaments of hills and fields, of rivers and seas and skies and mines to wrap in abstract gestures the shape of silent things that cannot be told. To weave its searching thread on the page like a trail of smoke in an empty sky. To trace the residue of its waiting, making known the unknowable reality of things with its fading line. To invite the shapelessness of things to take shape and to make a vessel from which to taste itself. And as I turn the page, the world again closes its eyes and untangles the woven fabric of its dreaming, giving itself back in silence to the bright, empty, unknowable reality of things.